Johnson, fairly recent graduate of Veterinary Yay. College of Veterinary Yay. Medicine at Kansas State University. Um, and I'm just going to be talking a little bit about feline dental health today, sinking our teeth into the matter, because it's a fairly common disease in most cats, and it's something that we're all dealing with, not only in our cattery situations, but also in our just everyday domestic cats, and we see a lot of it in the veterinary clinic. And so just start out today. Um, hopefully by the end of the talk, you'll have a little bit better idea of the classifications of some feline dental issues, uh, causes and risk factors of dental disease, and also how to manage and maintain good oral health on your cats. And the basic question, is there something in my teeth? <laughs> yes, <laughs> there is. <laughs> so we'll start off with classification. Um, and <coughs> Some of these aren't probably a, as of greatest interest to you as others, but um, there are structural uh, feline issues. You can have a variation in tooth number and morphology. Of course, all our kittens are born a, 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 a I never can say this, anodontia, which means having no teeth. But there can be occasions where you have them get to the age when they should start erupting their dishes, which teeth and none come out. It's a fairly uncommon thing that happens in cats, but it can happen. Oligodentia, odontia is um, less than the normal number of teeth. You can have that happen sometimes. Sometimes they won't erupt a few of the premolars that they should have. Just a little bit different um, variation. But again, not that common in cats. We see it more often in dogs. Uh, supernumerary <laughs> teeth is probably the most common thing that we see and that's or it's also called um, retention of the deciduous teeth so normally they have their baby teeth and those fall out and then they get their permanent teeth but occasionally especially the canine teeth you'll see those baby teeth tend to be retained and so you get the double fanged look um, pretty common in dogs as well um, and that's something that can eventually lead to some dent some other dental issues if it's not taken care of in a proper time. Um, persistence of deciduous teeth. And we can also have supernumerary teeth happen where it's not just the baby teeth, it's they have more than normal number of adult teeth too. But not that very common in cats. Uh, gemination is actually the growing of, it, it's, a, it's a double tooth and it can either be from a single root or it can be a root that splits into two teeth, but you actually have a, a, a double rooted or a double crowned tooth, <laughs> one or the other. And a lot of times they think that that happens due to trauma, usually early trauma, before that actual um, tooth bud is still in the gum, hasn't erupted yet. There's some sort of trauma that happens and causes that bud to actually create the two teeth at the same time. It's not really that much of an impact on dental health other than the fact is if you have crowding um, in the teeth, it can affect, affect it. And you also have fusion, which is actually just simply fusion of two teeth, two adult teeth that are normally by themselves. And again, probably think that is caused due to trauma um, early in life. Uh, we have malocclusion. Um, we have two types. So we have a skeletal malocclusion, which has to, it, depends on the structure of the jaw. Um, all four quadrants of the jaw in the cat actually grow independently of each other as the kittens are growing. So if you have trauma or something happened early in life, you can have issues where those arcades are not actually growing at the same rate. And so you can get mandibular pronathism, which we see quite often on your Persians, some other breeds, uh, English Bulldogs in the, in the dog world where they get the, the jut out jaw. You can also get maxillary pronathism where the upper jaw is overshot from the lower jaw. And again, those type of things are going to cause bite issues and also can contribute to having dental disease because the teeth are supposed to line up in a certain way when you're chewing and the surfaces get cleaned as the animal chews. And so if you have a malocclusion, you can have dental issues um, later on down in life because of the inaccuracy of the, the prehension of the food. And we can also have dental malocclusions 
where our teeth are not properly lined up. So you have one that juts out to one side or uh, one that grows out of the side of the gum, something like that. And again, those malocclusions can eventually lead to other uh, stomatitis problems, gingivitis problems. <coughs> and such, thank you very much. Um, we also have various swellings and tumors that can be several different things. Um, osteomyelitis is an infection actually of the bone can occur in the jaw. It's just inflammation. Basically, and you get a proliferative, usually you get a proliferative response where the, the bone just starts growing at an abnormal rate, and you can get large lumps on the jaw. Um, you can also get um, actual, not proliferation, but uh, decreased bone density. So the odontoclast or the, the, the bone, the cells that make up the bone actually go in there and they start munching things away and so you can get erosion of a jaw and that can be caused by myelitis. Eosinic, eosinophilic granuloma complex sometimes called rodent ulcers or indolent ulcers and these are real little red plaques that they sometimes get on their gums and it's due to uh, an increased activity of eosinophils which are a normal white blood cell in the body. Um, don't see those too often. Mostly we see those on cats that are outside, outdoor cats, running around eating rodents. That's why they're called rodent ulcers. Um, they can get that. Of course, we have neoplasia, and there are various different types of neoplasia. Many of them are benign. They, they just are an abnormal um, growing of the cells of the gingiva and the teeth. Um, but some of them are quite serious and malignant. Of course, the most common ones in cats are squamous cell carcinoma and fibrocarcinoma. And those are pretty, pretty traumatic and <coughs> something that you'd want to get into your vet and take a uh, look at fairly quickly. And then, of course, we have trauma. Um, we have jaw fractures, um, hit by car. Not something that we normally have to worry about in a cattery situation because most of the time they're inside. But um, they, they do have, the wall. they can run into the wall, this is true. I have some that are edge challenged and like to fall off things, so, um, but trauma is always one classification of dental disease that we see as well. Before you move on, what was yeah. the picture? What, what this was is, um, this oh. is a, a, a swelling, this is most likely um, just a little benign tumor, um, a little epilude, they call them epiludes. Um, on the teeth, but it could be, this could be also um, a tooth root abscess that has ruptured out. It could be a squamous cell carcinoma, but it's just showing a, a, a so possible you can't tell swelling. Exactly by looking at it. Not by just visually looking at it, no, no. Are the malignancies in the mouth fairly invasive? Are they gonna, you know, do they pretty much stay in that location or are they? Um, the squamous cell carcinoma is very invasive. Um, especially in, in the oral cavity. Um, I didn't, <laughs> I had some pictures that were pretty graphic, but I didn't want to freak anybody out. So I didn't put them on, but I mean, they can go, you know, it can take up an entire side of a cat's face. And um, so those type of things can be, and squamous cell, unfortunately, is a very, very invasive, very bad um, form of neoplasia. So it, um, and it tends, to travel pretty quickly. Um, but if you can diagnose it early, I mean, there are things that can be done, and I'll talk about that a little bit more when we get to the management part. But I mean, there are some options that you have for neoplasia. And if it's a benign tumor, usually just taking it off takes care of the problem and it doesn't ever spread. So, um, and probably the two that most people in the room are going to be uh, curious about are the periodontal disease and this is broadly um, broken into two different areas. And one of them is gingivitis, which is simply just the inflammation of the oral tissue or the gums. It is a reversible process. We don't have any damage being done to the support structures of the teeth. So if you can, can stop the problem at this stage, it's great because you can usually save the cat's teeth, which is great. And then we have periodontitis, which is actually 
this eventually progresses to periodontitis. You never get just gingivitis and oh, we're done, you know, oh, he's just got red gums and we can stop there. Um, it, it will eventually lead to periodontitis where you actually have weakening and loss of the support structures of that tooth. So the, the ligament that holds the tooth into the jaw, um, destruction of the bone of the jaw and those type of things, and actually destruction of the tooth itself. So um, periodontitis is usually not reversible. It's very difficult to reverse <coughs> severe periodontal disease. So we like to catch them at the gingivitis stage and get them worked on and get some things happening. So, and of course, usually most, most of the time, the first thing we notice is that they have really, really bad breath. <laughs> so what did you have for breakfast? An entire onion. Um, gingivitis is really, there's, it, everybody's welcome for <laughs> gingivitis. There's, there's no breed, sex, age, predilection at all. There is, however, a, a type of gingivitis, which is called juvenile hyperplastic gingivitis, which occurs um, mostly in purebred cats. Persians and Abyssinians seem to be predisposed, but it can happen in any breed, and I know it, ha it can happen to my, my Maine Coons. I've had it happen to my Maine Coons. But that, you get the really, really red gums, and then you get the tissue that actually grows. It, it just has a an over aggressive response and just grows. And so you get a buildup of, of gum tissue covering the teeth. Um, and this one is, again, inflammation and also overgrowth and it actually covers the crowns of the teeth. Um, and this is, this is an example of what probably most of you have seen at one time or another in some of your cats is the ninja bias. They get the nice red line Abyssinians, they call it red line, red gum line disease. It's just kind of something that's in the breed. And this is just inflammation of that gum that causes that red line. And of course, kittens that are cutting their adult teeth will tend to get this because you've got, you know, inflammation from those teeth coming through that gum. So it's not uncommon to see it in kittens when they're at that about four or five months old stage when they're starting to rub their permanent teeth. And then this is the hyperplastic gingivitis where you can see that gum is actually kind of grown down and is covering part of the teeth. Oh, they're not the best picture. I couldn't find a really good picture for it, unfortunately. But yeah, I you know, could have taken a picture of my teeth. But they're not as willing to just sit there and go, ah, while I take the picture. Um, and then we have Going on into periodontitis, um, there are some specific forms that uh, we deal with in veterinary medicine. The main one is gingivitis periodontitis. It's also called stomatitis, phocytis, uh, lymphocyte, lymphocytic plasmacytic stomatitis. It's got several, several names. Um, and in a few, whoops, in a few breeds, there is a juvenile onset gingivitis periodontitis. And this usually happens, it's a widespread inflammation in the mouth and it occurs at a very young age, before nine months of age. So it's past the time that you should be seeing all their permanent teeth should be erupted and you shouldn't be seeing the gingivitis and inflammation due to those teeth erupting. Um, and Siamese, Maine Coon and domestic short hairs seem to be predisposed to getting this early onset periodontitis, stomatitis. And again, you see at the time that their permanent teeth start to erupt, you get the really, really bad breath. That's one of the, the first signs of it. And, and it's real, I can't describe it to you, but it's a very distinct odor. I mean, when you smell it, you can almost say, oh, that cat's got LPS, because it just, it has a very, very distinct kind of metallic-y odor to it. So it's very, very distinct. Um, and then we also have, the adult gingivitis periodontitis that any cat can really get. There's no sex, no age, no breed predilections, but it does seem that Persians, Abyssinians, Siamese, Burmese, and Himalayans seem to have a more severe form of the disease and they really fight with it um, for longer periods of time. So, and I would personally on my own um, observations, I would, I would start to put Maine Coons in there because 
I just seem to be having issues with my kittens starting out with this and it's more of the juvenile onset in my Maine Coons but um, but we're seeing a lot of cats come through not purebred any cat with the adult gingivitis periodontitis. Amy? Yes. It is predominant in a lot of the Maine Coon lines. Yeah. You almost need to go back and look at the pedigree because yeah. it is yeah, that is true. And here are just some, I mean, it, it can, it's a wide variation of degrees uh, as far as severity. Um, fairly, I would say, I would call this a fairly minor case of stomatitis. You get the really red gums. You may have some recession of those gums to where it's exposing the roots. Um, this one's, you know, a fairly widespread case where you have it in the back of the throat. Um, along the incisors and some cats just have it on the back when you open their mouth the back areas which are called the the, the palatoglossal folds which is a big mouthful but where the where the jaw actually hinges um, sometimes they'll only have the inflammation back there and actually their gums don't seem to have a problem um, and then other ones you have you know extreme inflammation and deposition of more gum tissue and it's just a really really bad response so it it swings from one side to the other as far as severity on the stomatitis um, and then we have um, tooth resorptions or feline oral resorptive lesions neck lesions that they got several names but this is where um, this is a fairly common finding in cats and we have a, quite a r range of studies that have shown 25 to 75% of cats tend to be affected. Usually occurs as they're older. This is not something that occurs in young kittens, but after about two years of age. And it seems like as cats get older, if they have uh, tooth resorptions, they most likely are gonna get more and it increases, they seem to get more as they age. Um, and again, there's no real breed, sex, anything age predilection. Um, Persians and Siamese seem to have worse problems with them. Um, and this can be as simple as the crown just being a little bit eroded to actually the whole tooth, the root and the crown, everything being resorbed by the body. So that's why they end up, think they've lost their teeth and you don't know why. Exactly, exactly. Gone. That And that's what right. we see a lot of times. We yeah. see older cats come in and say, oh, well, they lost their teeth. Well, they shouldn't really be losing their teeth just because, um, and usually this is a, ch a case of their, their bodies actually resorbing those teeth and actually just eating them. It just eats away at their teeth. Well, so. I have Burmese and I have to admit that most of them seem to not have many teeth left after yeah. a certain point. Yeah. And I always wondered where, you know, I, where, I where do they go? They <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Like human teeth. Exactly. Out, and you can, you can see in a few cats, you can see them actually, um, worry with it sometimes. Well, they worry with it, but um, actually extruding, tooth extrude, they'll actually extrude their canines. Mm -hmm. Their body will, for whatever reason, the immune re response of the body will actually push their canines out. So a lot of people we've had come in and say, you know, they, I found this on the floor, what is it? And it's the canine tooth. Not as common in cats, it happens more in dogs than it does in cats, but I have seen it happen, especially in older Siamese, oddly enough. Um, they tend to, to repulse their canines for, for whatever reason, but they tend to be older, older Siamese and Siamese types um, on that. And these are just some very, um, what they look like. It, it, at first look, I mean, this one looks like, okay, is that hyperplastic gingiva or is that a tooth root lesion? But if you look at it, it looks like the gums kind of just come down and is laying on the surface of the tooth, but that's actually a resorptive lesion. And here uh, is another one, a little bit more severe case. And when they first started seeing these, they thought, oh, they're cavities. They're cavities like you and I get, but it's not really cavity because they don't, I mean, we don't, they don't eat away their enamel and everything like, like our bodies do as far as cavities. And so they came up with the, I don't know, who, who named them resorptive lesions, but it was a good name because here you can see the actual, you know, it's eroding away both the crown 
and the root. And sometimes you can even see on dental radiograph, you can see there's a crown, but there's absolutely no root. The root's been completely resorbed. And eventually then that crown's gonna And then, yeah, the, the crown will else, eventually yeah. fall off or yeah. you have it taken out. Uh, and, and there's varying degrees of resorptive lesions as well. They, yeah, they are. If and, and I'm going to talk a little bit about more when in the management. But um, if they're just if they're on the root and they're just affecting the surface of the root, and it's not into the pulp cavity, which is the main um, chamber in the you have where the nerves and everything like that are, it's not that painful. But majority of these guys will eventually eat into the root and into that pulp cavity, and those become very very very, very painful for the cat. A lot of times we see cats come in and if, if they have one, if you touch it, they'll, they'll chatter their teeth because it's so painful. And that kind of one of the tests that we do is we'll, we'll, if there's a suspect one, we'll, we'll just gently touch it. And if the cat chatters, it's usually